My name is Rick Renner, and this is the Medical Treatment Center in the Asclepion, which is located in the bottom part of ancient Pergamum. The Asclepion was a massive medical complex that attracted sick people from all over the Roman world. But when they came here, they didn't just come for medical help, they came for supernatural help. This was called the Asclepion because it was dedicated to the goddess Clepios, who was the Greek god of healing. And when people came here to be healed, one important part of the process was sleeping. And at night, of course, they had dreams. The people slept in this particular facility. This is one room where the sick slept. But there are all kinds of rooms here, and these rooms were filled with people. And during the night, when they went to sleep, they would have dreams. The next morning when they woke up, the priests of Asclepios would interview them to find out what they dreamed. And on the basis of their dreams, then they would begin to prescribe what kind of supernatural power was required to heal them. But there was something else very important that happened here. The serpent, or the snake, was the symbol of the god Asclepios. And during the night, while the sick were sleeping, the priests would come into this facility, this very facility, and they would release sacred snakes to slither all over the place during the night. And they believed if one of those snakes happened to slither across your body, if it actually touched you, that was the sign that the god Asclepios was touching you in a supernatural way. So when the sick were sleeping, they were also hoping that those snakes would slither across their bodies. This was a very, very evil, evil, dark religion. The early church had to know how to deal with evil. They had to know how to resist evil. We don't deal with that particular kind of evil today, but we deal with other forms of evil, things that are unjust, things that are not right, morals that are being pushed upon us, which do not agree with the teaching of the Bible. We need to know how to resist evil in our personal lives and in our families. And today I want to talk to you about resisting evil. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Thank you for letting me come right into your space today. Today we're going to jump right back into Revelation chapter 2 where we're looking at Christ's message to Pergamum. And today is the last program in this series. It's going to be good. And we're going to see what Christ offers to those who overcome. As I told you in the introduction to today's program, the church of Pergamum was assailed on every side by all kinds of evil. Evil religion, occult practices, an evil government, and most dangerous of all, right in the middle of the church was a doctrine of compromise and inclusion that was beginning to multiply. And this doctrine was deadly. Christ was against it. He said he hated it. He was against it. And in fact, he said he was coming with his sword to extricate it from the church if those who espoused it did not repent. Very strong words. But for those who overcame, Jesus offered them something marvelous and it's what he's still offering you and me today. So what in the world is he offering to those who overcome? That's what we're going to see. But I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series, Christ's Message to Pergamum. It's a 10-part series based on these programs with all the video, the photos, the historical points, the Greek words, and a study guide that is worth the whole package. You are just going to love the study guide. It is loaded with information that I couldn't get into the programs. You're going to love the study guide. This series is great for you to use personally to go over the Word and to really get it into your heart. Or if you're sitting down with someone to share the Word and disciple them, here is 10 parts. You can use 10 days to sit down and go over this Word with them. Or you could use it in a Bible study group. I can't imagine anything better for a Bible study group. And I guarantee you, because of what I teach in this series, the Bible study group will definitely have room for conversation and discussion. They'll talk a lot after hearing this series. It'll open them up to the Spirit of God. So order your copy today. Today is the last day of the program on this series, so be sure to order your copy. We're also offering you my book called No Room for Compromise. I love this book because it's so loaded with information, details, all kinds of teaching, and the amazing photography in this book. Every single page is full color. It's an investment to purchase this book, 
but it's an investment that you'll be glad you made. You'll put this on your coffee table, probably you'll put it in a visible place because it's so beautiful. Most people use it as a coffee table book and you will refer to it over and over and over. I think your grandchildren will look at it. Your children will look at it. Your guests who come to your house will say, my goodness, what a beautiful book. And it's just loaded with information that will literally take you from our world into the world of the first century to make the Bible come alive for you. And it's specifically about Christ's message to today's church, no room for compromise. I think you know we're living in a day when people are compromising and mitigating their faith, but Christ calls us to no compromise. Before we get into the Word, I want to tell you that if you need prayer, we're here for you. We believe in prayer and we're waiting to hear from you with your prayer requests. So contact us by phone, by email, by the internet, by letter, any way you want to reach out to us. I guarantee you we will hit our knees and we will pray for you. But today we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 2 and very quickly I want to read all of these verses to the church of Pergamum. And again, this really has relevance for you and me. And if you've missed these programs, go to our archives, listen to all these programs because they are rich. But let's begin today in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Pergamum write. Now your Bible may say Pergamus. The actual name of the city was Pergamum, so I've altered it to match what history says. And unto the angel of the church of Pergamum write. These things saith he, which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Wasn't that amazing to learn what that meant, Satan's seat? And how thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days, where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. We know that Antipas was slaughtered horribly on the Acropolis of Pergamum. And this verse twice says that Pergamum is where Satan dwelled. It really was a demonically infested city. Then verse 14 says, But I have a few things against thee, few things in Greek is oligia. Jesus is about to describe Aryan leaders. And by saying few things, the Greek word oligia, it tells us that there were not an abundance of these leaders. They were small in number at this time, but they were beginning to plow it to multiply inside the church. So Jesus raises his voice and tells them they have to stop the infection before it spreads to the entire body. So look at verse 14 again. I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them the hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which thing I hate. You say, well, who in the world were the Nicolaitans and what was their doctrine? Go to the archives, look it up. The program is called, Who Are Nicolaitans? It will tell you who they were then and who the Nicolaitans are today. It's very important for you to know. But notice what Jesus says to those who are in error. Verse 16, repent. We saw that the word repent is the Greek word metanoeo. It means change, decide to be different. I'm calling on you to make a change with your behavior and go in the right direction. He's speaking to the Aaron leaders and he's telling them to abandon their false doctrines and begin to teach what is correct. Repent, he says, or else. The Greek actually says, if not, however. It assumes that they're going to repent. If not, however, Jesus says, this is how I'm going to deal with them, Aaron leaders. I will come unto you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That word fight is the Greek word polemos. It doesn't describe just a skirmish, but it is an all-out war. Jesus is fully armed, fully engaged. And if these errant leaders will not repent, if they will not stop teaching inclusion, progressiveness, what they call open-mindedness, blending in with their neighbors, lowering their standards, which was really weakening the church, was bringing sin into the church, accommodation with the world. Christ says, if they won't repent, if they won't stop this, I'm going to come to them. He said quickly. The word quickly describes high-speed movement. Jesus had given them ample opportunity to repent. And now he says, time is running out, the clock is ticking, and very soon the opportunity is going to end, and when it ends, I'm going to deal with it very abruptly. I will come to them quickly and will fight, polemos, 
It will be an all-out war. Jesus is coming to deal with them. And notice it says, I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That word sword is the Greek word romphea. We've already seen this in the last program, but I want to cover it again. The word romphea does not describe a sword like the Roman sword you would think of. It is a Thracian sword. This word romphea is Thracian. It was the most feared of all weapons in the first century when this was written. Roman soldiers feared the romphea more than any weapon that their enemies possessed. Why? Because the romphea was essentially a sharp sickle-shaped blade affixed to a long pole. So just imagine if I had a long pole and on the end of the pole was a sharp sickle. That's what the romphea looked like. Why did it look like this? Well, listen to this. It was known for its ability to cut through thick armor and its long reach and its back and forth hacking motion was used like a farmer using a sickle. It penetrated the tightly packed formation of enemies. So those who held a romphea would literally stick it into the enemy and would begin hacking back and forth. By using this word sword, the Greek word romphea, Christ was literally saying, hey, if these errant leaders don't repent, I'm going to hack my way back into the church. I'm getting back inside. It is my church. I'm going to do what I have to do to retake the church for myself. And that is still what Jesus is saying today. He loves the church. And Jesus always gives people in error opportunity to repent. If they don't repent, he says the same thing to us today that he said to them then. If not, however, if you refuse to heed his instructions, if you choose to belligerently do what you want to do, claim that you're on the cutting edge of something new, a new day, a new time, we're going to go a new direction, but it veers from the teaching of the Bible, you need to understand Christ is going to come to you. Eventually time will run out. And Christ will say, I'm going to deal with them in a different way. And really in this verse, this is love. Because Christ is calling out to them, giving them a final opportunity to wake up, to shape up, and to repent so they don't incur judgment. Jesus is warning them. And he says, I will come unto thee quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Then listen to verse 17, Revelation 2, 17. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. In Jesus' own ministry, when he was walking on the earth, Jesus made this statement six times, he that has an ear. Jesus was all the time saying this. So when John was writing this verse, this was not the first time John had heard this. Jesus heard, John heard Jesus say this even when Jesus was walking on the earth. Jesus has always been looking for anybody that has an ear to hear. And it implies some people don't have ears to hear. Some people don't want to hear. But if you have an ear to hear, the Spirit has something to say. Now somebody might say, well, this message to Pergamum, it was just for a church in the first century. Really? What does verse 17 say? He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. It's plural. There were seven churches in the book of Revelation. There were churches all over Asia at that time, all over the Roman Empire. But because it is plural... It implies the message to Pergamum applied to all churches at that time and to the church in all ages. This message is also for you and me. It's for the church today. It's for your church. It's for every church. But Jesus says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, and to him that overcometh, I will give the eat of the hidden manna. What does that mean to overcome? First of all, the Greek tense is very important. It doesn't mean to him who currently overcomes, it's continuous. It describes continual overcoming. God never calls us just to win a battle and then lose the war. Many people win small battles, but they don't win the overall war. This is continuous. We're called to perpetually be overcomers, to perpetually win, to perpetually win the battle. We're to always be overcomers. In fact, the Greek tense really describes a person who overcame, who is overcoming, and who will continue to overcome. We are called to a lifestyle of overcoming. Now, what does that word overcometh 
mean? Well, it is from the Greek word nikao. Again, the Greek tense points to one who's in the process of continually overcoming, but it depicts a victor, a champion, or one who possesses some kind of superiority. This means Christ is calling you to be a victor. Christ is calling you to be a champion. He's calling you to have superiority over the adverse things of life. It can be translated to conquer. That implies there's something to conquer. To defeat, to master, there's something you need to master. To overcome, there's something for you to overcome. To overwhelm, to surpass, or to be altogether victorious. It was used to portray athletes who mastered their sport and reigned supreme as champion in the games. They defeated all the other athletes. It could describe a military victory of one foe against another. It means to be permanently and consistently undeterred in one's efforts to overcome and to obtain a lasting victory. Again, not a temporary victory, but a lasting victory. It can be translated to control, to conquer, defeat, master, overcome, overwhelm, surpass, or be victorious. That is what Christ calls me to, and that's what he calls you to. Maybe you've had a low-level victory, a small battle. That's good, but don't stop there. You're called to be altogether victorious, to master life, to overcome life, to defeat the odds, and to do it consistently to the end of your life. And in this verse, Christ makes a promise to people who have a determination to constantly overcome in life. Wow! Well, the Church of Pergamum was involved in really intense spiritual warfare. They were battling for its ex very existence by forces from the outside and forces from the inside, but Jesus called on them to overcome. It didn't matter how tough it was. His charge to them was to overcome. Overcome. And that is Christ's charge to you. And if Christ tells you to overcome, guess what? You can do it. You can do it. If you need somebody to pray with you, for you to have strength to overcome, call us. We'll pray with you because we will release our faith for that overcoming power to work inside your life. But the Bible says to him that overcometh, verse 17, will I give to eat of the hidden manna. What in the world does that mean, hidden manna? manna. Well, to understand this phrase, you've got to go back to the Old Testament where manna supernaturally appeared every day in the wilderness to feed the children of Israel. I'm going to read you directly from my notes because I don't want to miss any of these points. When manna first appeared in the Old Testament, the people of God were undertaking a difficult journey across the desert to their destination. And sometimes I want to tell you that when we're traveling to our destination, the journey can be difficult. Their food supplies dwindled, and they started to bemoan the difficulties of the journey. Have you ever griped about your spiritual walk? Have you ever said, Lord, this is too difficult? Lord, how long is it going to be till I finally get where you want me to be? That's what the children of Israel were doing. The wilderness was a huge expanse of desert that seemed to go on forever walk a mile in any direction and all they could see was desert. If they climbed on a hill to see what was in the future, all they could see was more sand. Everywhere they looked, it looked like desert. Would this ever end? And they were tempted to feel abandoned, forgotten, and discarded. Even though God had led them through the Red Sea, God had delivered them from Pharaoh's power, God had set them free from bondage, God protected them from the plagues, led them by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and gave them water from a rock. Think of all that God's done for you. And now you're questioning whether God's going to be faithful to you or whether you're going to make it to your destination. They were doubting God. The Bible tells us in Psalm 18, verse 19, they complained and even said, Can God set a table in the wilderness? Is God going to provide for us? Will God be faithful to us? Are we really going to make it all the way to the end? Are we going to starve on the way? What did God do? God is so merciful that He rained down manna from heaven to feed them and nourish them. Wow. That's what the Bible says in Psalm 78, verses 23 
through 25. Going to read a portion of it. It says, God opened the doors of heaven and rained down manna upon them to eat. The doors of heaven refers to a heavenly portal. By the way, the doors of heaven appears in the Old Testament three times. And every time the doors of heaven open, something magnificent pours down through it, something super abundant. And when God opened the portal of heaven, the manna began raining down. Now you might say, how much manna came in the space of 40 years? Well, we know. Rabbinical writings tell us one day's supply of manna, one day's supply, one day's supply was enough to feed the children of Israel for 2,000 years. Which means when God provides, God overdoes it. God wasn't worried that he was giving them too much manna or that he would run out of manna in heaven. When the manna came down from heaven, it provided in one day enough for them to eat in 2,000 years. Wow. How much manna fell? Over 40 years? Here's a rough estimate. By the way, you can read all of this in my book, No Room for Compromise. I really deal with it and how we calculate all this manna. Listen to this. It is estimated that 65,700,000 tons of manna supernaturally appeared on the ground over the space of 40 years. Now, let me ask you a question. If you woke up tomorrow and found tons and tons and tons and tons of manna laying on the ground all around your house, all over your city, how do you think people would respond to that? I'll tell you. Scientists would fly in from around the world to examine the manna. TV cameras would come from every major TV network in the world to film this event. Journalists would show up. Investigations would take place. This would be such an amazing event if you woke up to tons and tons of freshly baked bread that just appeared on the ground supernaturally. It would be a big event. But this happened for the people of Israel every day. And the manna replenished them. It strengthened them for the trip. And in this phrase, hidden manna, Jesus is saying, if you'll stay on track, if you'll stay on track, if you'll hold on to my name, if you won't deny the faith, if you'll stay on track with the Bible and do what I command you to do, I will supernaturally take care of you. Even if you feel like it's taking you a long time to get to your destination, even if you feel currently you're in a desert and you wonder how long it's going to take you to finally get where you're supposed to be, if you'll stay on track, I will be certain to pour down into your life everything you need to strengthen you for the journey, to replenish you, everything you need for you to be strong, to make it all the way to the end. But that promise is only made to those who have committed to overcome. So if you commit to overcome, Christ promises nourishment, strength, replenishment, and you will be empowered by Christ himself. He will empower you with heavenly manna, all kinds of nourishment. All you need to do is pull up to the table, sit at the table, but you got to come to the table and he'll provide what you need. That's amazing. I'll be back in just a moment. Now I'm going to pray for you. Explore the Bible and the first century church with Rick Renner's book, No Room for Compromise. In this masterful hardback Bible study, Rick transports you to the first century in the life of the early church, exploring the relevance of Jesus' end time message to the church of Pergamum then, and how that end time message is relevant today. On every page, Rick reveals the larger context of the book of Revelation and his appearance to the Apostle John, taking you on a journey through the first three centuries of Christian opposition within a pagan world. You'll be amazed to see how the early church thrived through the light, life, and power of Jesus Christ. This beautifully bound 400-page book can be yours for $80. Features on-location photography, added artwork, and historical illustrations that enhance the in-depth teaching. When you call or go online today, you can also get the 10-part teaching series, Christ's Message to the Church in Pergamum. As one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the church in Pergamum was a light of faith in the pagan darkness. In this series, you'll see how Jesus' message of holding on to faith is just as relevant today as it was in the first century. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. 
Don't miss this special offer, No Room for Compromise, and Christ's message to the church in Pergamum. Call now or go to renner.org to order. My name is Joel Renner, coming to you right from Moscow, Russia. And I want to tell you about the certain outreaches of our ministry that we do here in Russia. You know, people need help, but more importantly, people need Jesus. And in these outreaches that we provide, people can have both. They can receive help and Jesus. For decades, we have been able to touch millions of lives with the gospel of Christ and the love of God. We've been privileged to do this through broadcasting Christian television programs all over the world, starting churches that are thriving to this day, visiting orphanages with gifts for children and the workers, visiting prisons to minister hope in God's Word, visiting mental institutions to share the freedom that is found in Christ, equipping graduates of our Bible seminary so they can go out and help others, reaching thousands through our Internet Good News Church with Bible teaching and spiritual care. Because of you, we are able to take the gospel of Christ both to our nearby world and to the ends of the earth. Please call or go to renner.org to make a financial donation so that through your giving, we can continue to make this huge difference in people's lives. As I close today, I want to read Revelation 2.17 to you one more time. It says, To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Jesus does not call us to succumb to defeat. He calls us to pull a chair up to the table. And if we'll pull a chair up to the table, he will provide everything we need. Listen to this. Christ promises to provide spiritual nourishment and replenishment for all believers who will come to the table. He'll provide spiritual refreshment for tough times and all the spiritual nutrients you need to make it to the end of your journey. If we will come to the table, He will provide everything we need. Now listen to this last statement. I'm telling you, I've enjoyed this so much. When Christ offered manna to the believers in Pergamum, He was offering them consistent spiritual nourishment that would enable them to forge ahead and outlast the challenges that surrounded them. And that promise belongs to any believer who has decided to stay in the process of overcoming. That makes overcoming worth it all. You can overcome, my friend. Today we're offering you my series called Christ's Message to Pergamum, a 10-part series based on this programs. And we're also offering you this amazing book called No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church. But I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you that you've called us to a destination. To get there, we have to make a decision to overcome every obstacle along the way. I thank you that greater is he that dwells in us than he that is in the world. And if we'll overcome, you'll provide all the nourishment, all the replenishment we need to keep us strong to make it to the end. In Jesus' name, amen. This has been so enjoyable. Thank you for being with me today. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let God's word work in your life today. I'll see you in the next program.